Well, good day to you. It is December the 14th, 2020, and I hope you're having a great day wherever you happen to be. Now, if this is your first time ever listening to this channel, I do want to welcome and thank you. What we talk about here on Search for Signs is the emergence of Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. Through the course of these videos, we take a deeper look and hopefully gain a better understanding about who and what Maitreya is. We take a deeper look at why the master is returning now to the everyday world during this historical time. And of course, what does it mean for all of us? We talk about current events and tie it into that. And then we also take a look at the many miracle signs that have been going on all around the world in all walks of life to religious people and non-religious alike. And what does it mean? Does it mean what Benjamin Krem has been saying for years, that the one awaited by all the world's religions, Maitreya, is already here living in a modern city, and has been since the late 70s. Now, it's not so as important to believe what we say Maitreya is or even change your beliefs on anything, but it's very important for us to look at the priorities for humanity. Maitreya says, above all, man must create true and lasting peace first. We cannot tackle all the many problems together that we need to as a global community until we have a measure of peace. Maitreya says it's quite simple. Without sharing, there can be no justice. Without justice, there could be no peace. Without peace, there could be no future for humanity. So our very survival depends upon it. But let's get back to the first step because so many people want justice. So many people want peace. So many people want the environment fixed and so forth. But let's take a look at the first part because it really is the most important step, the first step. Once we take the first step, everything else will start to you know kind of fall in line. But the principle of sharing is not an ism. It's not communism. It's not socialism. It's really not done by, at least initially, by individuals. It's going to be done by nations, where nations take the excesses of what they have, sitting there rotting away sometimes, and giving it freely to those nations that need it. Every nation has an excess of something. Every nation has a need, of course. And in so doing, it would create not only uh, trust, but it would end hunger uh, probably within a few days, weeks, maybe, um, it would bring about trust among the nations and, of course, bring about peace. And then nations would start to tackle those other problems together, where now we're kind of just doing it haphazardly. One nation does it. The other nation doesn't care. You know, other nations are cheating where other nations need to really, you know, get in line and that kind of thing. So if you look at historically, if you look at right after World War II with the Marshall Plan, the United States, under the then Secretary of State, George C. Marshall, instituted the Marshall Plan, which is really what Maitreya is advocating for the entire world. But regionally, the United States gave the excesses that they had to war-torn Europe right after World War II. As uh, Western Europe started to rebuild their infrastructure, rebuild their economies, of course, then they took the excesses of what they had and gave it back as payment for what they initially took to help them out. Now, it was a process that didn't happen for very long, unfortunately, and it didn't happen globally. It was just kind of a regional thing. But if you look at the outcome, even though it was done for just a little amount of time, and it was, but those nations that participated in that sharing trust one another better than they trust any other nations on the planet. So that really shows you that you know, as Jesus said, a tree is known by its fruit, right? Well, the tree of sharing, or the fruit of sharing, or the tree of sharing is, is, of course, peace and trust, where what we're doing today is not bringing about peace, because if it did bring about peace, we would already have it, right? So it's very important for us to look at what we can do to bring about the principle of sharing in order to bring about peace. Now, um, I do have some questions to cover in this video, of course, and if you have a question about what we talk about here, I invite all questions. I even by comments because they do help to continue the conversation and help us gain a better understanding about what we're talking about here. But simply post your question as a comment. You can also email me at searchforsignsatmail.com and then I try to answer it in the next video. All righty, let's get on into it, of course. Now, the first uh, comment, actually, which I think will help, you know, give us some more information about this, comes from The Truth. 
And this person, don't know if it's a man or woman, don't want to assume gender these days, um, is talking about the video I put up entitled, Is Maitreya Going to Reveal Himself on 122120? Now, I don't know if they actually took the time to listen to this video because I actually said exactly what they said. But it says, Maitreya will not reveal himself on 122120. Of course, that's what I said. I agree. Not enough people responding yet. Agreed. That's what I said in the video. Nobody listens. <laughs> Everyone gets defensive. But there is progress being made. Well, thank you, the truth. Now, I do want to touch upon this a little bit because I talked about it in the video that they're commenting about. Um, I don't think Maitreya's um, declaration should be referred to as being revealed, okay? Because I do think there's a distinction in those two words. Maitreya will eventually declare himself as Maitreya on TV on the day of declaration. As the truth said, once uh, enough people are responding and people are listening more to and what Maitreya is talking about, then yes, we will demand from our media representatives that Maitreya speak to all the world at the same time. Maitreya is on TV and has been on TV for the last 10 years, portraying himself as an ordinary person, speaking in incognito. Now, he is the Lord of love. He is speaking heart to heart to people about there are many problems and, of course, the solutions to those problems. But because he's speaking in the way that he's speaking, he's obviously not being picked up on that he could be Maitreya. I do think millions of people, because he's already spoken to millions of people on TV, you, me, everybody else who's listening to this channel, there's a strong likelihood we've already seen him on TV, just not recognized him as of yet. But Eventually, he'll start to speak with a greater sense of urgency, a, you know, a stronger tone to his message and so forth. And then more and more people will start to respond, of course. And it will get to the point where we as a people will demand that he speak to the world all at one time. It's not gonna, The day of declaration isn't going to be forced on people. So to think that it will happen in a week... It's a lovely thought, but I don't think it's going to happen. There's going to have to be a, a, a length of time where there is a crescendo of interest into what Maitreya is talking about to bring the people and inspire them enough to tell their media representatives, hey, we want to hear what he has to say. Not what you have to say, what he has to say, because what he has to say makes sense. And the reason why it, it will make sense to all of us once we start to hear it more on what Maitreya wants to say is because he's going to be speaking heart to heart. He already knows within the hearts of all of us is the desire for oneness, is the truth of unity and so forth. And that's what he's going to be speaking to. We need to create the structures, economic, political, social, healthcare structures, educational structures that reflect that truth that we are all one. So nothing new, as Maitreya would say. He's not going to be speaking in a foreign language to people that they don't understand it. It's going to be, yes, I thought about that all along. Now somebody's on TV is speaking about it, speaking about it in a very relaxed way with zero fear. And that way he will really start to inspire and galvanize humanity to bring about these changes. But anyway, hopefully that helps. But nope, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be in a week. All right. Um, now, the next comment comes from Robert Lawrence, and, and I do want to address this one specifically to you, Robert. Um, I don't know if I had answered what you had, you know, you had brought this up before uh, about Alice Bailey, and I don't know if you're just talking about it or you want me to address it or what. So if you want me to address it, may I suggest phrasing it again in the form of a question? I'll try to answer it again, but I think we've talked about this enough. But there's some of the, there's some of the things in here I want to pull out that I think we can have a better understanding about how the masters work and how they work with their disciples, okay? So first of all, those who don't know, he's talking about Alice Bailey in this comment. Um, and Alice Bailey was one of four individuals who it, were one of the the individuals who initially brought the information about the masters of wisdom to the public. The first one was Helena Bavatsky, then Helena Rorich, and then Alice Bailey, and then, of course, Benjamin Krem. Alice Bailey lived and did the majority of her work during the time of World War I and World War II. Now, um, from what I gather, what he's saying again is through the course of his readings, he's read people such as Constance Kumbi and some others who are claiming that Alice Bailey has kind of an anti-Semitic kind of slant to some of her writing. Maybe she's prejudiced towards Jews or something like this. 
I don't know if that's what he's saying, but that's just kind of what I took. And it seems quite concerning to him. So that's what I'm addressing this with. Um, let's just say for argument's sake that she is. I don't think that she is anti-Semitic or anything like that, but let's just say if she is, okay? For one thing, it doesn't take away the good work that she did. And it also doesn't, it's not a reflection on the master that worked through her, the master DK. And it's definitely not a reflection on, on Maitreya, okay? The masters prior to 100,000 years ago were working directly with the public, known for who they were, and they made a choice to leave the public eye, okay? And they had good reason to, and I don't really want to get into it now because that's not really important to what we're trying to talk about here at this moment in time. But they, they left the public and they went into the mountain and desert regions around the world. And since then had worked indirectly stimulating and guiding and teaching humanity, showing humanity the way through their disciples in the world. So any man, woman, or, you know, throughout history that has made some kind of impact in whatever field of endeavor they were working in, were working with these masters. Most of the time they didn't know it. They just had this idea, this invention, maybe this musical, you know, way of doing art or whatever, a political idea or whatever it happens to be, a discovery of some kind. But they were inspired by these masters. Uh, sometimes they were consciously working with them, like the master, G like Jesus was, like uh, Abraham Lincoln, like Shakespeare, some of the painters, the Renaissance painters and so forth, were very consciously aware of working with these masters. But most, for the most part, most people, are, most of these disciples are totally unaware of these masters, but yet are working with them, okay? Now, the masters, and the reason why their work is going, you know, has always been so slow in getting out to humanity for change and so forth is because they're working indirectly through these disciples in the world. And every one of them had issues on some kind, some more than others. So if Alice Bailey was prejudiced towards Jewish people, then that's on Alice Bailey. It's not on the, on the master DK because she wasn't perfect. Okay. She was very advanced disciple, but she wasn't perfect. So to expect her to be perfect without fault is kind of naive. Okay. Now, the work that she did, and I'm going to kind of summarize it. She worked with the Master DK for, for over two decades, I think, and created this huge volume of work about the Master's teaching in a very scientific way. And it will be studied and learned for centuries to come. So her work has really just started out, you know, but she also gave the, made the announcement or Maitreya made the announcement through her that he was going to return uh, very soon after 1945. If humanity made efforts in creating peace to some degree, the principle sharing to some degree, and of course the political parties around the world had to start cleaning house. If they did those three things, then he could come back, which obviously we did to some degree because he was able to come back. She also, and this will, the, the truth of this and the importance of this will be better known once the masters are out to the general public. But she also gave out the great invocation, which will be used by humanity for the coming time to help bring about the changes. It's an amazing invocation. It's written in the link of, this, of these videos. You can read for it yourself and so forth. But it was given out by Maitreya through her. So those are three things that she did where they were just astounding. And the full effect of her service will be felt for centuries to come. Okay. But she wasn't perfect <laughs> to make sense. The other, you know, another example of this would be somebody like Paul, right? Who never met Jesus, had his own prejudice toward what, Je you know, what the early Christians were, were saying. He took it to a whole other level. He was of course prejudiced towards women, towards homosexuals, towards other people that didn't have his same belief as him. He of course was very, prejudicial toward his view towards Jesus. He, he was one of the people that kind of helped put Jesus on that pedestal that he's the only true son of God, even though there's no truth to it. But you can't deny what he did. I mean, what he did was he brought the ideas of the Christ to all the world. So even though he had those prejudices, you know, his work was felt for thousands of years. And we'd be living in a totally different world if it wasn't for Paul. Now, because of who he was, 
his prejudice rubbed off on all the early Christian founders, you know, and the Christian churches and so forth. And of course, we're still grappling with some of the prejudices, the same prejudices that Paul wrote into his teachings today, right? So there's, I'm not, I'm not condoning those prejudices, but they, you have to look at the good over the bad sometimes, I guess, you know, and every single one of us have prejudices and issues and so forth. And the masters worked with disciples like Mozart. He had his issues. They worked with disciples like Picasso. He definitely had issues. Abraham Lincoln had his issues. You know, William Shakespeare, the list goes on and on and on. Every single one of them had issues on something, prejudice towards something, that kind of thing, but yet did great work in some level. So it's more important, I think, to look at that, but hopefully that helps you know, kind of get rid of some of the concerns, but it really isn't important. If you don't, if you don't want, you know, want to read Alice Bailey anymore because you think she's anti-Semitic, then whatever, <laughs> you know. So if you have a, another question about it, I guess ask it in a different way. Maybe I can answer it better for you. But anyway, hopefully that helps. All righty. Um, I don't really necessarily want to talk about this because this is, this is, but it's, um, I guess useful. I mean, I, th- I really think it's kind of cool what she wrote. But um, uh, a person named Zen was commenting about the last video I did where I uh, interviewed a friend of mine, Betsy Whitfield, who had a light image of the Master Jesus appear in her house. And she was talking about this phenomenon called, is it Bell's, Bell Miz Faces? And I haven't looked it up yet. I apologize, but I'll look it up. But really how it, um, she was saying how it helps to confirm the fact that there's life after death. So I definitely recommend reading what she wrote because it was quite inspirational. So thank you for that, Zen. All right. And then uh, lastly, uh, a friend of mine, David O, was commenting about a video where I, I, it's entitled, Is UFO Activity Related to the Return of the Christ? And he said, Gary, hi, Gary. I haven't posted in a while. That's okay. But it's good to hear from you again. But I have a question. Is UFO activity related to fallen angels? I am curious about that since the religious claim the UFOs are angels fallen from heaven and not extraterrestrial. Thanks. P.S. What are the greys and are they demons? Okay, so I'll answer the three questions very simply and then we'll get into it a little bit deeper. Okay, how about that? Is UFO activity related to fallen angels? No. What are the greys? They are figments of people's imaginations. There's no truth to them. And then are they demons? Well, of course not. The two people that I trust most about UFOs are George Adamski and Benjamin Krem. They both claimed contact with these space brothers. They called them space brothers. Um, And they both said that they look exactly like people on this planet. So they don't look like little green men with big eyes and long fingers and so forth or the greys or whatever like that. And they, they both went on to say that they were here on a spiritual mission helping humanity and have been since the dawn of time. Whether it's with UFOs and their, and their space vehicles or actually down in the trenches with us, living amongst us as a lot of them do. Okay, Now, real quick before I get into it too, um, I'm going to be interviewing later on this week a gentleman named Gerard Artson, who's very knowledgeable about the Space Brothers, about George Adamski, and I definitely recommend David and everybody else to listen to what he has to say, because he's quite fascinating. International author talking about this stuff, so uh, about UFOs and aliens and tying it into my tree and the Masters of Wisdom, so hopefully you'll listen to it. But anyway, in the meantime, you got, you're stuck with me. Um, now, Is UFOs related to fallen angels? I'm curious about that since the religious claim the UFOs are angels fallen from heaven and not extraterrestrials. Okay, so the one word that comes to my mind is, David, is paradigm. We all see life through a paradigm, right? And the religious are no exception. So those people who are fundamentally religious see the life through their uh, religious and dogma paradigm. You know, I see life through a paradigm, you see life through a paradigm, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Every one of us are guilty of this. You know, my, um, Benjamin Krem used to always say at the beginning of every one of his videos that he hoped that every one of us would listen to this message with an open mind. And then he went on to say that most of us imagine ourselves having an open mind, but he said for as far as he could tell, a truly open mind was the rarest thing on earth. And I, I have to say, you probably have to be a master on the level of being a master to truly have an open mind. 
Now, when we were born, when we were children, we, of course, have a truly open mind. We are not conditioned at all and so forth, but none of us remember that, right? <laughs> you know, but to, to master it, we have to be a master. So every one of us is seeing life through a paradigm, which is also kind of goes back to what Robert Lawrence was talking about with Alice Bailey. She saw her life through a paradigm, too. So, um, so they see the evidence of these uh, UFOs, perhaps. They maybe even to some degree believe that it's happening, but they have to see it through the paradigm of religion. So then they say they're fallen angels, okay? Just as if you look at our ancestors, right? There's a lot of writing. There's a lot of drawings on cave wall, you know, cave walls and so forth. But there's a lot of writings about chariots of fire in the sky and so forth. Could it mean that they were talking about UFOs? Very possible, you know, because that would re- mean that they were seeing life through that paradigm. They had no concept of airplanes or ships or mother ships or whatever like that. You know, they saw them as chariots of fire. Just a, just a thought, you know. And, it, you know, so I, I think that there's nothing unique about seeing life like that. But anyway, no, the, the Space Brothers are here. They're here on a spiritual mission, uh, according to Benjamin Krem and the Masters, they, one of their main activities, which they work tirelessly day in and day out and have been for decades, is helping to clean our atmosphere up and the pollution within our atmosphere up enough to where they can, you know, life can be sustained on this planet until we learn not to harm the environment the way that we're doing. Most of us are uh, totally unaware of the danger of nuclear radiation because we're told by our scientists and our so called world leaders that it's safe. And we trust them and we believe it, but there's no truth to it because when a scientist measures whether there's nuclear leakage or not in a, let's say a silo or a a naval vessel that's nuclear or a nuclear missile or something, when they put the, um, what do you call it? The uh, Geiger counter up to it, it's not measuring anything. So they say it's safe, right? Well, radiation that causes all the problems is on one of the higher levels of the uh, of physicality called the etheric which also relates to the space brothers because that's where they live is on the etheric planes not another dimension it's a higher level of physicality there's seven layers of physicality not just solid liquid and gas but then four other layers of etheric so this nuclear radiation is so fine on the etheric levels that it goes right past the lead in the concrete and goes right out into the atmosphere. And then it's so fine that the, the wind actually takes it up into the higher atmosphere in the clouds. And then it comes down, you know, hundreds of miles away in raindrops or, you know, that kind of thing. It gets all over us. It saturates our homes. It gets into our water and our food supply and so forth. We ingest it through that. And that's what's causing a lot of the illnesses today. And so these space brothers help clean that up to a degree to keep it semi-safe for us, or we'd all be really, really sick or dead, you know? And eventually Maitreya will, will be the one that will come out and say, yes, they are here, they've been here, we have nothing to fear. And hopefully by that time, we will trust Maitreya enough that we'll believe them, right? But these space brothers who don't look like the greys they don't look like marvin the martian they look like us uh except for the martians are actually shorter because there's more people living on mars than living on on our planet but anyway uh and that's the reason why they're so short but they they look like regular people and they live on the higher etheric planes of those planets so if you were to go to mars or venus you would not see anybody of course unless you had etheric vision and then you see these beautiful cities you'd see millions of billions of people on these planets all hustling and bustling about you know if you had etheric vision and you looked up into our atmosphere you would see at any moment you'd see hundreds maybe even thousands of ships flying all over the place but because they're invisible to the naked eye and we don't because we don't have etheric vision well we don't see them until they want us to, you know, they want to be shown to us. And then they lower their vibration down and then we see the ship and then they raise their vibration up and it's like they disappear and went into another dimension. But they're still there. It's just they're on another physic the level, you know, they're just up on a higher level of physicality. So hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that helps. But anyway, um, it's getting a little long and I want to kind of stop it for now. But if you have any questions in the future, please don't hesitate to ask. All right. Take care and have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. And as always, take action. Help SOP save our planet.
Thanks for listening, and we look forward to talking to you again in future videos. Have a great day. Thank you.